I'd like to introduce Professor Suzanne Palmer, Associate Professor from Concordia University. She is a senior researcher of new religious movements. She published extensively. Um, her latest book is called uh, Storming Zion, about government raids on new religious movements. And, but uh, she's going to present now her work, which is related to a former book um, called The New Heretics about new religious movements in France. And her lecture is titled France's Brainwashing um, Applications of the, I can't say it, Abu, Abu de Faiblesse in the War, of the War on Sects, 2001 to 2016. Thank you. Thank you. Shalom, everybody. I think most of you are familiar with the concept of brainwashing, which dates back to the 1950s. It all started with this sudden inexplicable conversion of American GIs to communist ideology while incarcerated in, P in POW camps in the Korean War. Two American psychologists interview these men to investigate the process of conversion, and they each published their uh, results in 1961. Their conclusions were that brainwashing process combines peer pressure, incarceration, threats and beatings, thus the GIs were coerced first and then convinced. The scientific validity of the brainwashing theory has been questioned by psychologists and sociologists since it fails, to, it fails the test of Karl Popper's principle of falsifiability the inherent testability of any scientific hypothesis. Brainwashing is even one of the entries in Williams' Encyclopedia of Pseudoscience. Since the 1980s, the scientific community and the US courts have discarded brainwashing theory as lacking in scientific rigor. But in France, the allegations of, of brainwashing or manipulation mentale um, is quite common due to, and certainly admissible in court due to the Abu Picard law. The Abu Picard law of 2001, who invented this law and why? It was Senator Nicholas Abu and Catherine Picard of the National Assembly, and she wrote a book that explained this law called Sects. Sects means cults in, in French. Democracy and Mondialization, uh, Globalization. And there's a little um, paragraph there that notes that in the, that 10 years after the law, which would be 2011, in the National Assembly, they found that um, there were only four or five decisions out of 35 um, that related to cults or what they call dérive sectaire in, in Fran France. In other words, um, the purpose of the law was to catch cults, but in fact, it's been used quite a bit for other things, like, for example, disputes over inheritance, um, you know, uh, undue influence, that kind of thing. Now, the aim of the 2000 law, which was very explicitly um, well, explained in, in Catherine Picard's book and also um, to the media, was to reinforce the prevention and suppression of sectarian movements that infringe on human rights and fundamental freedoms by extending the criminal liability of corporations for certain offenses leading to their dissolution. By corporations, they mean the associations, which really mean voluntary associations or charities, which is usually the legal um, framework for new religions in France. This new law limits the public outreach of sectarian movements and punishes the abuse of the state of ignorance or weakness by individuals. The penalty, if you're found guilty of a but de faiblesse, um, you can be punished by going to prison up for three years or by uh, 375 euros uh, fine. Often, in, in practice, often the guilty receive a short suspended sentence, um, like one year uh, with sursi means suspended, and, but, and often the convictions involve heavy fines and damages or compensations to the victims. 
Now, the very first application of this law was in 2002. That's one year after the law was passed, when um, Arnaud Moussi, who was the prophet and the, the leader of a tiny little group that combined, I don't know, Gnostic philosophy, Christianity, Freemasonry in, in Nantes, it was called Neophar, one of the members committed suicide. So Arnaud Moussi was on trial for use, you know, for a beautiful bless leading to a member's suicide. So I was very puzzled by this because he wasn't even in the same city when the suicide happened. And if you study religious suicides like Catherine Wessinger and our friends, um, usually the leader is right there orchestrating the whole event in a ritual context. So I went to visit him in Nantes and he actually took me to this cathedral. That, that's him in the middle with his twin brother. And we're looking at this beautiful Renaissance sculpture of Francois de, uh, Francis the, the second, which by the way, Moussi interpreted in it. He interpreted the esoteric symbols of this sculpture and was giving me a huge uh, lecture on how Jesus would unite with Mary Magdalene at the end of time and pointing to this. And it's quite funny because tourists were walking by and they stopped to listen and they were all puzzled. Um, now, uh, so what happened is I was trying to, I decided, I, I managed to publish this study um, and my paper on a beautiful bless and the case of Moussi. And it appeared in my book, The New Heretics of France. Also, it's on the Chesner website, by the way. Um, and I tried to track down more cases, but I couldn't. I found it very difficult, so I just gave up. Until last year, when I got an email out of the blue from this man who is from India, and he complained he was under house arrest in France. So he had been charged with a de faiblesse, and he was not able to leave the country. And in fact, he spent two and a half years stuck in France, uh, unable to see his grandchildren or attend to his business in Canada because he was accused of this new um, law. Um, and after, after hearing his case, which I'll, I'll, I'll explain in detail, I was so fascinated, I decided to try to track down the other cases. And after phoning lawyers and the human rights things and giving up, I suddenly had a well, a very silly idea of how to do research. And so I went and typed into the, you know, Google guru. Now, guru is this silly French word spelt G-O-U-G-O-U, -O -U, which means, you know, cult leader um, for the French. And if you're, if you're a woman, it's gourel. And so I typed in a beautiful bless guru. And suddenly, boom, all these uh, news reports popped up. And so I ended up with 32 cases and of course, I have to rely on what the media said, which is obviously not very, um, you know, reliable. But it was it was very interesting because I found out what type of people tend to be accused of, you know, brainwashing or abus de faiblesse, and you know what professions, what kind of penalties they get. Um, so I got a good insight into the abus de faiblesse scene in France, so to speak. Now to get back to Arnaud Moussi, maybe I'll just go to the front. Maybe I, I don't want to distract you because this is so interesting. Now I'm going to read out his story, which I summarized from the documents he sent me and from two Skype interviews and also talking to his lawyers. And his story says everything because it, it describes the process where you are accused of a beautiful bless and the kind of legal process you go through. Um, so I'll read it out. In November 2014, I'll call him Patel, by the way, because he still hasn't received the final documents that will allow him to escape from France. So he said, don't use my name, or you can use it in your publication, but not in your you know, lecture. In November 2014, Patel visited France as a tourist to spend holiday with his close friend, Asuri, who works as a life coach, astrologist, and medit teacher, meditation teacher in Lyon. This was his third third visit to her. As usual, he volunteered to assist her in one of her meditation workshops before they drove off to Spain for a holiday. 
This workshop featured the mystic rose meditation designed by Osho or Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. I offered to help her in small ways, he says, mainly by picking up dirty tissues, cooking the meals, cleaning the meditation hall, moving mattresses, unloading the van, opening windows, lighting candles. Midway through the workshop, a squadron of heavily armed gendarmes in Kevlar helmets and vests raided their home at seven and arrested Patel and Suri, his friend. They were, all, they were all armed and behaved as though they were saving the participants from a very dangerous situation. Later, Patel was to learn the police were, were from Kaimades, which is a special force of policemen trained in 1920, uh, created in 2008 by France's, France's anti-cult interministerial mission, the highest level of the government, uh, Mivalut it's called, and it's specially trained to recognize and track recognize and crack down on cults. When the Kaimadas agents delivered them to the prison, they explained to the jailer they belonged to the sect of Osho, the sex guru. Patel and his friend Shuri were held in separate sale, jails for, jail cells for three, eight weeks, and because we were foreigners, foreigners and because the investigating judge was too busy to see us, there's no habeas corpus in France, he said. Patel speaks English, and six Hindi languages, but no French. So he couldn't read the criminal charges. The translator assigned to him explained that I had used fraudulent techniques to manipulate weak minds, to defraud them of their money, and I had used Indian techniques to create a mysterious Indian atmosphere in order to influence these people who had weak minds, and that I was a big leader of the sect of the Indian sex guru Osho. Patel had been interrogated for three to four hours with no lawyer present. He was driven from Lyon to a prison in Fontainebleau where he was inter interrogated for three days, again with, without a lawyer. His money, credit cards, computer, and travel documents were confiscated, and the only food was fish sandwiches. He's a vegetarian. I told him I am an engineer by profession. I have no experience in leading meditation groups or in coaching people. I speak no French, I took no money, and I did not know any of her clients. Later, Patel found out that a woman from an influential Lyon family had attended Shuri's uh, 2011 meditation workshop. Her husband and father were concerned by the changes in her personality and had filed a complaint with a local anti-cult movement. The general used his political influence to convince a judge to order her phone tapped or the Suri, you know, the, the meditation teachers. So after seven weeks in prison, Patel met the investigating judge. She asked him about his Indian spirituality. He explained to her that he was just helping an old friend, and since he didn't speak one word of French, how could he possibly have manipulated the clients? The judge later wrote in her report that Patel had manipulated people through his silence. <laughs> The charges against him were of hiding behind Indian philosophy and creating a mysterious atmosphere by using incense candles, Indian music, and techniques. He explained to the judge that Suri's clients had been instructed to bring their own CDs for the music and that he'd not selected it and that the candles and incense were purchased at Ikea. He objected he was not hiding behind Indian philosophy. He told her he was from India and proud of his culture. He'd grown up in a family that always dabbled in meditation and attended the lectures of visiting gurus, not for business, but in a playful fashion. He objected to the way the Sanskrit word guru was used in France. In the Hindu tradition, guru means a teacher of truth or enlightened being. The great philosophers of the Vedas were gurus. And yet somehow in 21st century France, the word guru had come to mean a sort of slimy snake oil salesman who defrauds his followers through brainwashing techniques and should be locked up. I explained to the judge that most Indians had one or more gurus in their life, and I had had six gurus, so I pick on Osho. He actually met uh, Osho when he was a child uh, who, who lectured in the house next to his grandmother, and he'd, he'd hung out with six different gurus, and he had one sort of serious guru named Ramana, but they just ignored that one. But Patel said the judge was not listening to him. I am familiar with British law, 
Canadian law and US law. But in France, they have a different system. When someone complains, then the procureur, the prosecuting judge, establishes the criminal charge. Next, he picks a juge d'instruction, an investigating judge, usually a friend, whose job is to find evidence to support the initial charges. So the way he saw it is you're, you're not innocent. Well, you're, you're, you're not innocent till proven guilty. Um, Patel noted that the three defense lawyers warned him of this investigation, that the process was not neutral, nor was it time bound. But they said there was nothing they could do. This is not London, it is Lyon, they said. We defense lawyers have a hard time defending our clients. In fact, my lawyer's assistant warned me, once you've been accused of abus de faiblesse, well, forget it, there's nothing you can do. 29 former clients of Suri had been tracked down by the anti-cult movement's lawyers who filed complaints on their behalf. By March 2015, the investigating judge had interviewed all 29 clients. They each declared they had no complaints against Suri, that they'd benefited from her workshops. Most of them said they never met Patel. The few who'd met him said they never spoke to him because he didn't speak French. According to Patel, the judge's response is, but this proves that they're brainwashed. One of the characteristics of a beautiful blesse is that the victims do not realize they're being manipulated. But by July 2015, at the Court of Appeals, it became amply clear that none of the 29 victims had any complaints. So they were dismissed from the case, and three new victims were found to replace them. All three stated they had no complaints against Suri or Patel, and even, the pro even so, the prosecuting judge recommended that, she, that the investigating judge should charge Suri and Patel with manipulating mentally the three new victims. As a result, the investigation would be extended for another year. Um, so for, anyway, so for two, 22 months, oh no, that's terrible, okay. Anyway, so that's Patel's story, which, which I think says it all, but um, I'll continue. And these are the 32 cases I've found. Obviously, we don't have time to go into them in detail. And here's a picture of the police who are trained to crack down on cults and perform raids. And this is a portrait of the um, elaborate legal system in France, um, which is really different from the US. And there are different categories of um, you know, def uh, people who are accused. Most of them are therapists and healers, mostly alternative. So the kind of uh, therapist you'd find in Esalen Institute. Um, or another category is psychiatrists or who start communes, who have charismatic claims and start communes. This guy was a magne magnetizer or channeler who channeled uh, the grandfather of one of his female followers and told her she had to sleep with him in order to cure her illness. Um, this is a woman who was just doing primal scream therapy, which was seen as a technique of mental manipulation coming out of her own mind. Um, this is, uh, okay, also uh, many of them, this, this group here is accused of sexual, uh, well, sexual abuse, various sexual crimes. Um, now, another thing is they're accused of um, escroquery, uh, fraud, or extorting too much money from clients, or laundering money, or what's called travail dissimulé, um, uh, working, getting people to work under the table. So if you're in a yoga ashram and people are washing dishes and not getting paid, there, there could be a police raid, and you could be accused of a beautiful bus, and that actually has happened. I can't believe it actually happened. I was in a yoga ashram where everyone was, you know, I was washing the laundry and so on. Okay, this woman is a voyant, or a sort of seer, who, um, and she wrote a book explaining how she ripped off all these people by, by doing her fake, you know, voyant stuff. Um, oh yes, this is an interesting case. This is a woman from, um, Martinique, who was a voodoo priestess, and she was doing the traditional, you know, slaughtering chickens, chanting, whatever, rattles, and charging people money. And so she was arrested in a huge raid with these police and accused of abus de faiblesse, you know, sort of 
brainwashing them to give her money. But of course, if she'd been at home in Martinique, this would have been totally non-controversial. And this is a Catholic mystic who has visits from the Virgin Mary every, uh, the 15th of every month, and she has followers who, she has a sort of Marian devotion group where people donate money and communicate with the Virgin Mary. And she got into a lot of trouble and in fact dissolved her group and went into hospital. Oh, an interesting thing is that a beautiful bless um, charge is used to uh, lock up psychiatrists who, or psychotherapists who rely on the recovered memory um, technique, you know, in what they call inducing fault, false memories, which often alienate families because, you know, the client finds out that her father raped her when she was, you know, a child. Naturally, when the father hears that, he's going to complain to the anti-cult movement. So a lot of these therapists who use this are now in prison and they're given huge fines. There's a zero tolerance now for recovered memory in France. Okay, so I'll just, uh, two more slides while I talk about the, my, my critiques of the Abu Picard law, which by the way, you can also find on the internet from other people. Um, okay, the familiar patterns found in ecstatic and communal religions that, that we as scholars would know about are interpreted as the guru's personal techniques of man manipulation and mental. For, um, one example would be giving people spiritual names. This is seen as a way to disorient them and put them under your control and make them forget their past. Another would be um, voluntary labor, which is seen as you know doing something to for the for the guru's gain and ripping off people and wearing them out so they can be more easily manipulated. Another would be living communally, giving your money to the group, and also rituals that put people in altered states of consciousness, like certainly uh, Santo da, what we heard of from uh, Stefano, uh, would see the leader manipulating. Um, now, the sh there, now the second thing is the law has shifted in the way it's been applied and in its function. The idea was it was to control cults and, and uh, lock up cult leaders, and then the idea of cults shifted to the idea of cultic harm or derive sectaire. But there was the idea that if you have a sect, inevitably there's going to be harm and crimes and abuse and so on. So, but instead of just um, you know punishing people for crimes, you you say they're sectarian crimes or if you like. Uh, brainwashing crimes, so then the punishment is heavier. Um, and now um, it's used very much to pr punish people who use in undue influence, and these can just be in a secular con context where somebody in, you know, tells their great-grandmother to leave the money to them and then someone else is annoyed in the family and that sort of thing. Um, okay, third, the question of the authenticity of the victims of a beautiful bless. The, the lawyers in the anti-cult movement scrounge up victims. Um, for example, um, Suri, you know, the, the Patel's therapist friend, was saying that um, sometimes people who just called her once to say, I'm interested in your workshop, and then she'd say, it costs so much. She said, sorry, I can't afford it, it's too expensive. She said, well, you could take a cheaper workshop, I'm doing this. And all this was recorded because her phone was tapped. So they said this was using repeated pressure to influence and put the person into you know, psychological captivity. And so they would, th this person would be on the, in court as a victim, although they just made one brief con phone call and maybe not even ever taken her course. Um, secondly, the, the lawyers at the big anti-cult uh, group in France called UNADFI, they have the power to uh, start lawsuits on behalf of victims that might be unwitting. For example, someone's child is in a group, and so the lawyer would start a lawsuit on behalf of this, this person who didn't even know it was happening. And they, they could even uh, have a victim who protested in court, but I'm not a victim. I like being in this group. You know, the person's never manipulated me. They can write affidavits saying, I've never felt coerced, and they'll still be considered as a victim 
because this powerful anti-cult group has these lawyers who write up these. The third thing is the personal motivations of self-styled victims. In some of the cases I studied, um, sometimes the person who launched the first complaint to the anti-cult groups would be um, a former lover who was, you know, annoyed that they'd been discarded. Or um, in one case, there was the daughter of a, a leader who wanted to inherit his house and he was taking too long to pop off. Or, or anyway, that was the allegation. Um, so in some cases, in some cases, of course, the motivations of the complainant is pretty clear. And in fact, you have to sympathize with them. But in other cases, they're, they're a little bit suspect. Okay, to continue, this is my last slide. The social political context. This is a law that emerged from France's state-sponsored anti-sect movement, hence it's intrinsically biased. In my book, The New Heretics of France, I look at how the anti-cult movement has succeeded in um, being part of the government's agenda. And so there's in fact this, this mission that's part of the National Assembly to, to fight derive sectaire or cultic harm. And there's a very powerful anti-cult group called UNADFI. And um, you know, it's, it's, it's not private like in most uh, countries. And therefore this law is very much comes out of that uh, context. Abu de Fay bless the concept relies on the theory of brainwashing um, or mental manipulation and uh, the idea of uh, mental, mental hold or grip. And as, as I said at the very beginning of, the, of this lecture, um, this concept of brainwashing has been, you know, criticized in, in other countries and is not considered, you know, valid. Um, the positive aspects of the Abu de Faiblesse, it does permit the law to punish recovered memory therapists. And, but the negative aspects, it targets mystics, healers, therapists, commu leaders, and foreign or exotic priests or pac practitioners. For example, there was a Hari Krishna who was sent to jail. And I mean, he did actually commit crimes. But it, one thing he was criticized was for making his followers chant with beads and dance on the street and try to pressure other people to join, which the Hare Krishna people, of course, do routinely. Um, and of course, France has always been a place for mystics and healers. And if Joan of Arc were alive today, she would probably be accused of abus de faiblesse. And so, of course, would Mother Anne Lee or some of the great, or Joseph Smith, or some of the great you know, mystics and prophets of our era. OK, that's all. Thank you. talk, um, especially in our local Israeli context, um, as the Adam introduced in the beginning of the conference, this whole project of Meida Center emerged when similar initiative for legisla anti cult legislation uh, developed here in Israel, and we're still trying to struggle, struggle against it. Um, we have time for exactly one question. Um, yes, please. Really? What's going on in Turkey right now in terms of the, uh, the per per uh, persecution of uh, followers of uh, Fatullah Gulen uh, and uh, people who are not followers of Fatullah Gulen but who are now followers of Fatullah Gulen, whether they ever even knew about it or not, you know. Um, but I, I want my question is: um, is in, in France right now? I mean, uh, it's still under a state of emergency, right? It has been extended now, uh, and and is there uh, under the state of emergency in France right now the uh, brainwashing uh, has it has the state of emergency made it easier for the state to simply uh, you know throw people in jail uh, on on these absurd sort of uh, charges is and also is there is there any overlap between uh, you know the anti cult movement in in France and then of course the anti terrorist uh, business I mean are Muslims being uh, accused of uh, brainwashing and, well, and this sort of thing? that's interesting. I haven't found a single case of Abu de Faiblesse applied to, you know, a Muslim or a, quote, terrorist jihadist or something. But there, I was, I just came from the ICSA, which is, you know, the big anti-cult conference, international anti-cult conference, which was in Bordeaux. 
and there were a lot of papers um, looking at the resemblance between cult conversion and jihadism and l looking at like de-radicalization methods and comparing it to deprogramming. Mm -hmm. um, so there is that kind of connection being made. So maybe it's, maybe it's coming down the pike, huh? Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Seems like, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you very much. We need to finish. Um, one short administrative announcement. Um, the ISSNR business meeting, lunch business meeting, will take place in room 207 right now at 1.45. Um, to remind you that tours leave Jaffa, tours one, two, three, leave Jaffa Gate at four o'clock, so please be there on time. Um, thank you very much for all the four panelists. It was a wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you.